Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So like all of you, in preparation for today, I was asked to explain what sustainability means to me in 10 words or less. Thank you very much, Emily. So here it is. Sustainability is understanding we are all connected and acting accordingly. And for me, this image of a living water garden by Betsy Damon, Betsy Damon's sort of both an artist and an activist. She works with keepers of the waters. And this, this garden is about this idea of understanding we're all connected and acting accordingly. The garden takes polluted water and streams it through uh, biofilters. And by the end, you can see in the, at the top there, it's clean enough for children to be able to play with. So I am a mother, an eco-feminist, a professor of women and gender studies, and all of these components of my identity and many others help to frame how I understand the world in general and sustainability in particular. I teach a course called Women, Health, and the Environment. And at the beginning of this semester, several students said to me they didn't understand how environmental issues were also gender issues. And so for thinking about the connection between environmental issues and gender issues, I turned to ecofeminism. So what is ecofeminism? It's a tool, a lens, for analyzing the connections between environmental justice and gender justice. It also sometimes challenges some of our deeply held assumptions. It calls on us to recognize the systems of racism, sexism, homophobia, and all other forms of oppression. In brief, ecofeminism challenges us to think about the ways that the social mentality that leads to the domination and oppression of women is directly connected to the social mentality that leads to the abuse of the environment. So what does that mean in practical terms? One way that ecofeminists talk about that is that we use these metaphors to talk about the Earth as a woman. And it's not coincidental that we treat both the Earth and actual women badly. Ecofeminism can help us to understand many different components of how we see systems operating in the world. So a good example for me is thinking about and talking about climate change. I'm sure you've all heard a thing or two about climate change, right? We've talked about it a little bit even here today. But most mainstream analysis of climate change does not include gender in the focus. So we know that women and girls may be more dependent on resources that are most threatened by climate change. Women's bodies may respond differently to rising levels of heat. In France in 2003, there were extreme heat waves, and women had a higher mortality rate than men. So all of these elements in thinking about how we analyze climate change mean that we have to include more women at the table when we're talking about climate change. This group, Gender CC, is calling for governments to make sure that they include women at the table and women's voices in talking about adaptation and mitigation strategies. They want to make sure that the way that we're handling climate change doesn't exacerbate already existing inequalities between women and men. Another example is thinking about Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So October in the United States is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And I'm sure you've noticed, just even in the Kirkhoff Center on the way to lunch, Colleges Against Cancer had a table. They, they um, sell a lot of pink promotion items, right? The pink products are everywhere, including NFL uniforms recently. So how do these pink promotions challenge us to think about breast cancer? What kind of images and messages are they telling us about what we should be thinking about breast cancer? And so, Part of my research is looking at all this proliferation of pink ribbon products and thinking about what is it that they're asking of us. And so an organization called Think Before You Pink has coined the term pinkwashing that is about the ways that corporations who may be involved in harmful business practices are subverting our attention by slapping pink ribbons on their products. We have to look at and think about what exactly, when I buy that Yo Play yogurt with a pink lid, how much of that is really going towards 
addressing breast cancer, and in what ways do we want to be addressing breast cancer? Think Before You Pink has also called our attention to a number of the breast cancer-related marketing campaigns are about beauty products, and in particular, in the beauty products we have in the United States often contain parabens. Parabens are chemicals that act like estrogens but come from a source outside the body or xenoestrogens. And we know, even though research about environmental links in breast cancer has been marginalized, right, we don't, there hasn't been a lot of serious attention to environmental risks related to breast cancer, partly because we focus a lot on both individual responsibility and pharmaceutical cures, right? This idea of we're, not, we're doing the science that's going to lead us down the road towards something that, that we can sell. But what we know in that, in the in this marginalized science that there has been, what we do know is that there's this link between parabens and breast cancer. So why is it that so many of our beauty manufacturing products and companies are willing to slap a pink ribbon on their products, but they're not willing to address taking the parabens out of their products. A third area that's of concern to ecofeminists is maternal health. So thinking about maternal mortality, more maternal incidence, um, environmentalist and ecologist Sandra Steingreber calls on us to think about if the world environment is contaminated, so too is the environment of the mother. And if the mother's environment is contaminated, right, in the womb, so too is going to be the child that inhabits that womb. So we have to think about how poor women and women of color have an additional toxic burden, partly because of occupational hazards, partly because of where they live. They may live in communities that have more contaminants and less political and social power to keep those contaminants away from them. In addition to pregnancy, ecofeminists want us to think about breast milk, and the breast milk itself, again, is highly contaminated. Um, breast milk has a lot of fat in it. There are persistent organic pollutants that end up in breast milk, so breast milk becomes contaminated. It's contaminated all the way up to Inuit mothers who live in the Arctic Circle. So whose responsibility, then, is it to think about how do we get safer and cleaner breast milk? Is that an individual responsibility or a collective responsibility? What are we doing as a society, as a culture, to ensure that breast milk, which should be sort of a perfect food for human babies, is safe and healthy? I also wanted to think about, I wanted to take uh, the last few minutes that I have to talk a little bit about imperfect activism and thinking about these issues. So I come to events like this and I get all excited and maybe a little bit overwhelmed, right, about sort of what, what folks are doing. And, um, you know, Levi is a good friend, but I'm not going to be able to grow all of my own food. Um, in fact, this summer, out of four tomato plants, I managed to coax just one tomato out of it. So, so how do I deal with that? So I'm a CFA member, so I, I managed to sort of connect to the food that way. And I think about imperfect activism as sort of when I make choices about what I'm doing, I try to be making better choices, but I also sort of let myself off the hook if sometimes I make choices that aren't as sustaining, right? Chocolate for me, you know, I can't have an, an option to buy local chocolate, but I sometimes try to buy chocolate from organizations that support fair trade chocolate practices. And I'd love to tell you that on Halloween, I was only giving out fair trade chocolate, but sadly, that's not the reality. So thinking about this idea of imperfect activism, how do we move from sort of where we are right now to sort of where we want to be going? And I sort of liked the philosophy behind Graham Hill's idea that maybe we can do it part way, right? It doesn't have to be sort of all or nothing. My students right now are reading Barbara Kingsolver's Animal Vegetable Miracle, where she um, outlines her family's attempt to live for a whole year eating only locally. And that's not possible or even desirable for many of us. So thinking about how we're all connected and acting accordingly, and this idea that our activism, however we practice it, is going to sort of be complicated. In the introduction to Grassroots, a field guide to feminist activism, Winona LaDuke talks about her activism as being messy, right? It's something that she sort of has to fit in between all of the other components of her life. She said, people have an image of me that I'm always only ever sort of focusing on the next strategy. And she said, you know, I do my activism. Sometimes I've, you know, I've been sitting at the kitchen table and, and nursing my child, or, you know, I have a mess going on. And so this idea that we sort of 
practice our activism in and around the mess. And so all of our lives are messy. But I ask us all to sort of think about how we can remember those connections, and in particular, adding in a, a gender lens about ecofeminism that's really about making these connections between, we, we were talking a little bit at lunch about this idea that, that you sort of can't and gender injustice without also addressing racism, sexism, and homophobia. And I really would like us to think about how we can't make a movement in one of those directions without sort of connecting all of those pieces and the building the coalition. So how are we understanding we're all connected and then acting accordingly? Thank you.